listening to the It's Only Rock and Roll Podcast with your host, Don DiMuccio. All right. Welcome to the It's Only Rock and Roll Podcast. Yes, I am your master of ceremonies, Don DiMuccio. And in a few minutes, we're going to be talking to the legendary guitarist, singer, and original founding member of Grand Funk Railroad, the man responsible for writing the band's most enduring tracks like Heartbreaker, Rock and Roll Soul, Foot Stomp and Music, Bad Time, and the classic, I'm Your Captain Closer to Home. Flint, Michigan's favorite son, Mark Farner, joins us momentarily. You know, the word legendary is bandied about an awful lot when talking about people in the entertainment business. But when it comes to today's guest, that moniker is right on the money. As founding member of the 1970s powerhouse outfit Grand Funk Railroad, he, along with drummer Don Brewer and bassist Mel Shocker, catapulted to success through sold-out, high-energy arena shows and songs that continued to dominate rock radio even four decades later. Classics like Bad Time, or an American Band, Some Kind of Wonderful, and his epic masterpiece, Closer to Home. He's now as busy as ever with his group, Mark Farner's American Band, whose upcoming DVD from Chile with Love is currently available for pre-order. Please welcome to the It's Only Rock and Roll podcast, the aforementioned Mark Farner. Good morning, sir. Hey, good morning, Don. Good to be here with you, brother. Well, thanks for agreeing to do this. We appreciate it. Yeah, man. You sound like you're having a good time doing this still after all these years, huh? Yes, absolutely. I, hey, dude, I'm proud to be sucking air. There you go. <laughs> I want to start off with something that's always intrigued me. Not just with your band, but a lot of bands. Like the way Hawthorne, California gave the Beach Boys their unique musical flavor and the way the Grateful Dead come from, from the Bay Area and, of course, Liverpool with the Beatles. How much did the experience of growing up in Flint, Michigan, a real blue-collar working man's town, influence the sound of Grand Funk Railroad? Oh, yeah. It's, it, it was the music that we listened to, and we listened to CKLW out of Windsor, Ontario. That was like, a, I think it was 50,000 or 100,000 watts. Big, it would boom into Flint, Michigan. Listen to uh, WTAC. That was AM. You know, and CKLW was AM. Yeah. WTRX AM. WAMM AM. All AM stations. Man, we were into the rhythm and blues. My sister and I would go into these dances and enter the dance contests and win them. Uh, my mother, you know, she showed us how to dance. And my sister Diane and I would, we just, uh, you know, we're family. We get in there and, and really tear it up. And man, they love to see us come. So the music was a 100% influence on us. But the people in Flint, Michigan, were not all natives of Flint. We're talking about people like my mother that moved there when she was 16 years old with her whole family to get jobs yeah. in the auto factories. Uh, Buick was there, Fisher Body, Chevrolet, uh, Stamp and Frame, AC, Delco. You know, they brought people from every state. They attracted because of the high paying wages. Sure. Uh, you know, people moved in here and they brought their instruments with them, Don. Mm -hmm. You know, and every Sunday at my mom's or, or my mom's sister, Aunt Dorothy, at our houses, there would be a jam session every Sunday. Everybody brought their instruments and they would jam banjo, violin, guitar. My dad blew saxophone and played guitar. And the women, oh my. My God, they sang the best harmony. I was always marveling at how good their harmony was. Now, give me an idea of the year we're talking about. Oh, uh, we're talking 50. No, it would be about. Uh, I start remembering, you know, back when I was like four years old. So my 52, 53 yeah. years. Yeah. And that's really what my sister and I liked to dance to was the R&B songs. It was the best to dance to. When the British invasion came, was that something that you were into? No, and as a matter of fact, I mean, when the Beatles came out, of course, everybody got into them because they wanted to see what this was all about. I even grew my hair out long, and I would put the V05 on there to slick it back, <laughs> you know, before right. I go to school. And the British invasion, I didn't like the terminology, the British invasion, because if you really source it out, the British invasion happened two days before Christmas, 1913. It's called the Federal Reserve Act. There's your British uh, invasion. Okay. You definitely, without being overt, definitely have a, a political tone to you. Whether it was your songs, you've got a historian's vocabulary. Am I on base there or no? Absolutely. I, uh, I know what's going on. In my heart, I've, uh, you know, I always come from the heart. And people know me, Don, because 
I am who my songs say I am. Right. And that's that's how people know me. I've always reached out, thank God, from a, a heart that was not so jaded that I took offense to anything and and wanted to hurt somebody or get back or get even. I just want uh, people to understand that we are love in our heart. We came from love. We were not born with M16s in our hands or knives in our teeth. We got to be taught how to do that kind of stuff. But who we really are in our true nature, we are some pretty nice little kids down in there. You can be. Yep. We can be. You're right. It's like with racism. That's not something you're born with. That's something you're taught. And, yeah, man. And, and so many negative things. I love the story about Frank Zappa when he was producing you guys and you got into a conversation about guns. Yeah. You know, this is the days of vinyl too, Don. So we couldn't put all 15 songs that we had recorded on the album. So Frank is sitting there. He says, we got to weed some of these songs out. And he says, well, what about this song here? Don't let them take your gun. And I said, that song is not leaving this album. Mm -hmm. That song is going to be one of the featured songs on this album. And I explained to him, I said, people are under the wrong impression about guns. And I said, the media always kind of paints it as a black image that's behind the commentator. And it's always this dark thing. And then they glorify the use of guns in the movies. Right. And tell us that they're going to come after ours. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. You know, I mean, that's not constitutional. So after I explained, he said, you know something? I really didn't know that about the Second Amendment because I I quoted. I said, you know, a well-regulated militia. Mm -hmm. And when it gets to the part of necessary for the freedom of state, necessary There is no question about the definition of this word. None. So he said, holy crap, man. He's like, wow, I've never shot a gun. I said, you want to shoot a gun? He says, hell yeah, I want to shoot a gun. I said, well, what what do you want to shoot? He says, you got a dirty Harry? (laughs) (laughs) And I said, yeah, man, I got a dirty Harry. You just stay here and I'll go over to the farm and grab my dirty Harry. So I go get my Smith & Wesson Model 29 44 Magnum, but I put 44 special shells in it because the Magnum shells would have turned him off on shooting a firearm. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're so report and, and so much kick to them uh, with a Magnum, but with a 44 special, it tames it right down. And I said, I'll put up a, a target over here on the hill. We had a great big hill that we would shoot into. And he says, man, I don't need a tire. I just need some cans. I want to shoot a can like they do in the movies. <laughs> <laughs> so we set some beer cans out there. I don't know where they came from, but we found some and set them up on the hill. And he took his first shot and plugged that can dead center and he's so excited he's got his two hands out in front of him with this 44 mag and he comes swinging around to look at us guys that are standing behind him in the parking lot and he's got the gun and it's swinging around here and we're all like ducking and hitting the (laughs) dirt (laughs) going frank frank no put point that gun towards the guy (laughs) he was just so excited for plugging that can on the first shot and became a life member of the National Rifle Association. So God rest Frank's soul and God bless us for having had him and his music in our lives. Absolutely. And you took the time to explain it to him because that's the the whole deal. In my mind, it's a culture. Yeah. And I don't mean that in a sarcastic way or no, there is a culture behind it. And if you're not exposed to it, my personal beliefs were that many of my heroes were killed with guns. Uh huh. Like John Lennon. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. uh, Bobby Kennedy. You know, that's, so if Absolutely. that's all your exposure, you're going to be held bent against them. Yes. The, the way you explain it, people take the time to, to learn what's going on. You've got to just train people not to be evil. Right on. Absolutely. Oh, people. Grand Funk formed from a band that was actually five-piece, and I was a stand-up lead singer. I didn't play an instrument in this band, and it was called The Fabulous Pack. And we were booked through a, an outfit called Delta Promotions out of Bay City, Michigan. Mm-hmm. 
And they said, we got you guys some gigs out in Boston. And you go out there and you play these gigs for free. And then, you know, we can go back in the next time and actually get you guys some money for it. And so, you know, we're dumb kids out of Flint, Michigan. Say, yeah, let's go do that. Yeah. Well, we went out there and unbeknownst to us, the gigs that we were playing, we were paid for, but we didn't see the money. The guy that was out in Boston was taking the money, and I I don't know. What I don't they believe did with it. it. That something <laughs> like that would happen in the music business? No. <laughs> so when we got back after you know being stranded there for two weeks, down we were on Cape Cod, uh, East Sandwich, Massachusetts, stranded in beach cottages. Mm -hmm. uh, and they weren't uh, insulated or anything. It wasn't, you know. I know the area to, well. Yep. Yeah. So being socked in with the, the snow and couldn't get food, we were down to oatmeal that we got from the guy at the East Sandwich variety store up there. And that was all we had. We didn't have any sugar. We didn't have any butter, no milk, nothing to put on it. We would just melt down snow because the pipes were frozen. Yeah. We melt the snow down and make this oatmeal uh, that would get us to the next bowl of oatmeal. <laughs> I mean, it was bad. Wow. It was really bad. So we got the guy at the store. Uh, he finally let us use the phone, and Brewer got a hold of his mother, and she Western Unioned some cash up to a drugstore that was up north of where the bridge goes over to the Cape there. So we, we hitchhike up to the drugstore, get the cash, rent a van, and get everybody and, and get home. But two of the guys were married, and those guys had to quit the band because their wives were threatening to divorce them. And they had been gone away from home and no phone yeah. contact or anything. These gals didn't know if their husbands were dead or alive or anything. Nobody knew. So that's the end of that for them. That's, yeah. yeah. So Brewer and I said, well, I was talking and I said, dude, you know, we need to start a three piece. I said, look at Cream. Look at Hendrix. Look at the bands that are coming out that are three piece. I said, we could do a three piece rock funk band. He said, you know, maybe that's a good idea, but who would we get to play bass? I said, I don't know, but we need to go up to Delta Promotions and give them a piece of our mind because when we found out we were actually being paid for those gigs, oh man, that put a bad uh, taste in our mouth and we wanted to find out who was responsible for it. And, and if there was any of that money left, we wanted it. So, oh yeah. We go to Delta Promotions and we're sitting out in the waiting room and part of their uh, facility, they, it was a rehearsal facility and there was a band in rehearsing and, and you couldn't see or you couldn't hear the band really. You could just feel the bass coming through the wall. Yeah. And Brewer and I sitting there and I said, man, are you hearing that bass player in there? That guy's playing that bass. I wonder who that is. He says, that guy can play the bass, man. We got to find out who that is. So when they took their break, out walks Mel Shocker, my high school buddy. The, you know, Mel and I rode dirt bikes together. Uh, he had a 650 BSA he used for a dirt bike. I mean, it was crazy times. Yeah. And we would smoke a joint and ride. And, you know, we just hung out together and uh, were good friends. And when I saw it was him, I said, holy crap, Melvin. Uh, we're going to start a three-piece band, and, and would you be interested in... He says, man, I am so ready to leave this band. This is perfect timing. Yes, I will join. Let's do a three-piece. And so we started the following week at the Flint Federation of Musician Hall on Averill there in Flint, Michigan, and the rest is history. Terry Knight. Well, Don Brewer was in touch with Terry, and he came to me and he says, you know, Terry wants to be our manager. And I said, are you kidding me? I said, he will screw us. And Brewer said, well, at least we'll be out of Flint. He's got connections in New York City. And long story short is I finally said, well, okay, let's see what he can do. And he was a very good promoter. I thought that some of his ideas, they were genius. Mm. And he didn't have the integrity to go along with that kind of a mind. Right. And, and so he could screw you and not think anything of it. And, and that was proven. So, you know, as good as he was for us, he was the one that taught us how to look out for the bad guy because we didn't know he was in our camp, really. Right. And it, it's like the captain of a ship. You got to watch who you're letting on that ship because people 
will take you down just because they can't be captain. Yeah, right. How blessed were the Beatles to have someone like Brian Epstein? Wasn't oh perfect, but he really cared about them. Yeah, man. You know? Yeah. Unlike a Colonel Tom who just used Elvis, much like the, the circus promoter that he was. Just Absolutely. To- now, the Atlantic Pop Festival, 4th of July, 1969. Is that your first big gig? Yes, absolutely. Going to Atlanta, we borrowed a friend's van. We rented a U-Haul trailer, put all our equipment in there. And Jimmy, the driver of the van, our friend's friend, uh, he says, I'm going to give you the van and a driver. I don't want you guys driving that van. This guy drives real good. So we said, yeah, that's fine, man. Cool. That's even better. We can get some sleep on the way down there. So I'm riding shotgun. And this is, I mean, 69, this is a long time before I-75 was finished. Mm -hmm. And we were taking some of those side roads to get back onto the E-Way. And early morning, and I was kind of just cracking my eyes open. I look up and I see this sign, I-75, and it's got an arrow to the right. I said, hey, man, right, I-75's to the right. And he's going like hell bent, you know, I mean, he's going and and he just turns right going fast as he was going he just turns like he's it was crazy wow. that the, the trailer flipped over it came off the back of the van those safety chains that are supposed to yeah. keep the trailer they didn't they just snapped <laughs> so we had to go down in there in the ditch and all of us guys got on one side of that trailer and we righted it we all pushed that trailer. It was all that we could do, but it came back over. We backed that van down into the ditch, hooked the trailer on, pulled it out of there, and we were going down the expressway very slow. <laughs> and uh, and Jimmy was just freaking out, uh, the driver. And he says, well, it looks like we're doing okay, and we're doing maybe 45 miles an hour. You know, I mean, yeah. he didn't want to get it back up to a – expressway speed not knowing how it was going to be well as we're doing 45 miles an hour we see this wheel pass us it it goes past us and we're looking out the front window of that van we're watching this wheel go down through the median it hits a big bump there in the median and gets launched up in the air and the northbound truckers over on the other side were you know 18 wheelers We thought, oh, my God, it's going to hit that truck. Well, it went right over the cab of this 18-wheeler that was northbound and and landed in a field way the hell over. And we had to go retrieve that wheel. We got back, took a couple of lug nuts off the wheel that was on the other side of the trailer, Mm -hmm. put them on this wheel that we had retrieved, and we stayed on the the side of the road, the, the apron there, the shoulder, and went to the the next exit, had a U-Haul place right there. We traded the trailer in, put all of our stuff in. At that time, as we were switching the stuff, we found that the transformers had ripped off the chassis of these amplifiers, and the wires had broken, and oh, oh my God. God, it was a nightmare. So as soon as we got to Atlanta and to the Pop Festival... Our roadies were soldering, uh, you know, putting stuff back together, repairing, patching. It's like a pit crew. Oh, my God. Yeah. So they put it back together kind of haphazardly, uh, threw it up on top of the cabinets, and we were the opening band, 12 noon. And when it came time to go on, I walked up to the top of the steps, and it was about 15 steps up. Because we had looked out between the cracks in the fence and would push stuff to the side and look out at the first few rows. But you couldn't see the whole entire crowd right. until I was up on that deck and I looked out and I saw people as far as your eyes could see. And I went, holy crap, dude, I got a piss so bad. <laughs> <laughs> What was the venue? Was it a speedway or was it, what was that? It it was just out in a field next to a lake. I mean, it was good. Yeah, it was really a a nice spot as far as venue. It held all those folks and, and that was the main thing. The people loved us and... And the guy couldn't even say our name, Grand Funk Railroad. He said, "That's a Grand Frank something." I mean, he every time he would say our name, he would mess it up. For three times in a row, he messed it up. He never, <laughs> never could say it. 
But the audience got a load of who we were. Yeah. And I would always repeat it when I'd go back up on the stage to follow. We, we went on noon, opening day, 7 p.m. the second day, and 11 p.m. the third day. Oh, you did because, all three days? I didn't know that. Yeah, man. And the people wanted us there. And Capitol Records was there. They saw the reaction of this crowd, and we ended up signing with them. Or, well, we signed with Terry Knight, and he signed with Capitol, and that's another way uh, he put the screws to us. Thing with the festival for a second. That, you what, 20 years old? Yep, 20 years. You are up there with Led Zeppelin. They were on the festival. Chicago Transit Authority was there. Janis Joplin. Yeah. Did you get to mingle with those guys at all? No. Never, uh, never talked to them. Hmm. We just kind of stayed off to ourselves. But man, that festival, there was so many people. There was an OD tent behind the stage and people would be brought in there. And I learned to say things to the crowd and uh, to the audience to not accept things that people were handing out because these people are not your friends. Right. <laughs> you the know, pro proverbial don't take the brown acid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, brother. Well, speaking of and wow in the crowds, tell me about that ill-fated Led Zeppelin tour. Well, we started uh, Cleveland, and it was good, man, because Cleveland was uh, one of the towns that we played as the pack, and Terry Knight in the pack, and we used to do Channel 5, the upbeat show. So being that we were really popular in that area, they showed us. When we hit that stage, man, the, those uh, Ohio folks, man, they showed their love for us. And the next night, we had to play up in Detroit at Olympia. And we're on the stage, we're revving it up, and here we are in Detroit, which is even more of a hometown of crowd for us. Of course. And it was good. I'm telling you, it uh, it was it was really revved up, and the people were out of their seats, and they were up to the stage, and they were with the band, and we were fixing to go into inside looking out, and all of a sudden the power goes down. I look around because the only thing I'm hearing is drums. I turn around, Brewer's still playing, but I'm like trying to hit my guitar and Mel, I'm looking over at him and he, he's like, I'm, I don't have any. He's holding his hands up. I don't have any power. So Terry Knight comes walking out to the microphone, grabs the microphone and tells the audience, due to contractual obligation with Led Zeppelin, Grand Funk Railroad has to leave the stage now. And all the crowd just start booing and throwing wine bottles, whiskey, a beer bottle. I, I didn't know that these people brought all this stuff in with them. <laughs> I mean, like, oh my crap, man. So uh, we waited an hour and a half for Led Zeppelin to go on. And by that time, more than half the audience had already emptied out of Olympia. They went home. So that gave Mel and I the opportunity to go be in the audience and be undetected because we came in the back and snuck up to pretty close to, you know, where the audience started. Yeah. And we watched, we sat in seats and watched as these guys performed. And, and Jimmy did his little routine with the bow of a cello bow. And, uh, yeah. and uh, you know. Is it true that Peter Grant got physical with Terry Knight? Yeah, he picked him up by his shirt collar and Peter Grant, you know, he's a big guy, oh, ex-wrestler. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Terry Knight was uh, just scared shitless, buddy. He was scared. Uh, and you could tell just by the quivering in his voice as he was trying to make this announcement. It's so counterintuitive. It makes them look insecure. Uh-huh. They should just let you guys do your thing. And yeah, then, man. You know? And uh, yeah. they just kicked you off the tour after that for being too good? Yep, that was it. That's not. Did you get paid anyways? Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> That's right, brother. Videos, eh? Oh, yeah. And let me just preface this with having talked to WNEW out of New York City. Um, they did a uh, thing where they had 100 people write the definition of the song Bridge Over Troubled Water by Simon and Garfunkel. Okay. And they told me they got 100 diversely different definitions. Mm -hmm. So... It's like when somebody reads a book and they go to see the movie, they say, that movie sucked compared to the book. You know why? Because our imagination right. puts it together. But since the advent of video music, the imagination has gone in the shitter, buddy. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. And it, all it is is what you see before you on the screen. It's, it's not a hundred different 
definitions. It's just this one definition. So uh, that being said, Closer to Home was a middle of the night. It was uh, three o'clock in the morning, I think it was, Don, because I'd gone to sleep that night. And, and every time, I, you know, when I go to bed, I say my prayers. And I prayed to God that night. I said, God, would you please give me a song that would reach and touch the hearts of the folks you want to get to. And so I, I got up and wrote. I didn't know it was a song because I'm always writing, you know, in the middle of the night. If I am woke up by a thought, I'll write it down. You know, mm -hmm. I've got the paper and stuff right next to my bed. I don't record it because my wife's sleeping. But I write it down. And so I've got that legal pad next to the bed. I've set up. I start, everybody, listen to me and return me my ship. I'm just like... It just started coming. I'm in between the state of awake and somewhere just north of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm in a very special spiritual place, and all this these words start coming. I write them down. Uh, didn't think a thing of it. Like I said, I, I write stuff all the time. Um, so I got up in the morning. I go out to the kitchen. Um, I got a cup of coffee there. I grabbed my George Washburn acoustic guitar out of the corner, and I sit down and I start bump up, bump up, bump up, do 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 do. It's like, oh, what is this? What is this? And then I hit this inversion of a C chord that I had never made before. I went, wow, that is a pretty chord. Wow. And then I start thinking as I'm playing this da 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 da. You know, it's uh. I said, oh, maybe those words I wrote down, maybe that's a song. So I go grab my legal sheet, my little yellow pad, put it down on the table next to that coffee. I took a sip and started singing and playing the song. And as it gained momentum with me, and then I started hearing that breakdown. Am I in my cabin dreaming? You know, it's like, oh, yeah, this is going to be good. And I take it to rehearsal that day. And both Don and Mel said, Farner, that song's a hit, dude. They were right. Oh, yeah. I got chills when you sang just now, man. I don't get I, chills. I, have some, you, I appreciate it. Oh, man. God bless you. That voice well, of yours, God bless that. You hasn't changed at all. Thank you. Now, I how do you account you for that? that? How do you account for that? Uh, just being aware of my physical being, that uh, my spirit is in a bone suit, and this bone suit requires certain things to function properly. Right. So my wife, Lisa, it'll be 43 years, January 8th. Uh, God bless you. That's great. Thanks for that, Don. But just staying away from mucus causing things. I take a, it's a uh, supplement. A lot of people have not heard of this yet. I'm, I try to get it out to my audiences and yeah. what have you. I take Ilhua Ginseng. The uh, brand name is I-L. That's one word. The second word is hua, H-W-A, il hua. Okay. And I, t I take the resin. I have been taking that for 50 years. But recently, I would say in the last 10 years, I've started taking shilajit, S-H-I-L-A-J-I-T, shilajit. It's how it's pronounced. In India, they call it the destroyer of weakness. Hmm. It is a resin that is formed from when the continents collided and crushed all the organic. You know, this is back when trees were trees, dude. Right. And every, everything got mashed between, you know, the rocks. Well, now it, it comes out up above 12,500 feet in the Himalayas and the Altis in Russia. And it's a resin that oozes from the fissures and the cracks and the crevices of these rocks. And the Hunzas, the, the oldest living people on earth, they, they have been using this, you know, all of their lives. And I read an article where people were watching these monkeys and these monkeys were bigger. They were smarter than the, than the ones down at a lower altitude that were from the same origin. And the ones who ate the Shilaji were bigger and they were smarter and they just, they, so I started taking it and you got to watch what you get, what you order. There's a lot of fake stuff out there. You know, people yeah, yeah. sell you some cow pie and tell you it's yeah, yeah. Shilaji, but that keeps me going and, and it really helps me zero in and phase out every other thought that is trying to sneak into my mind as I'm trying to concentrate on things.
it's really beneficial for that. Well, let me tell you, I'm going to be 50 in February, and I've been a working musician for 30 years now. And uh, I can use all the help I can get, so I'm going to look into that. God bless you, brother. That sounds great. I always like to finish up or get close to the end. I always say, you know, what's your best gig? What's your worst gig? I'm going to take a guess at your best gig. Would it be the Shea Stadium show? You got that right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. And And I wrote that music. I penned it. And so for me to see all those folks... When we flew over the stadium in the helicopter and Humble Pie was making their debut performance at second base where the stage was set up, that place was actually dipping and bouncing. The whole damn thing was bouncing down to wow. the music. Yeah, it was, oh, just telling you I'm getting goosebumps. Yeah, we, yeah. You know, we landed in the parking lot where the limo was supposed to pick us up. There was no limo. So the guy that was with us ran down to the corner to a phone booth. This is long time before cell phones. Within two or three minutes, we had cop cars. We jump into cop cars, lights and sirens going all the way over to Shea. We get out and get into the limo that was supposed to have been in <laughs> the parking lot. Well, it's at Shea now and it's in back. So we get into that limo and, and drive into the into Shea, into the stadium. And when we got out there, the audience loved it. We was feeling the love right from the get-go before we even got on deck, dude. It was love, love, love. It was coming. And because Shea, the audience, was set up in a half circle, so being on second base, that is like the focal point of that shape. Yeah. And when they sang Closer to Home, they drowned out the PA, dude. This I'm talking serious. The 55,000 people singing that song in that half circle. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Wowzer. Yeah. <laughs> I know it was recorded. That should be remastered, cleaned up. But I heard on another interview where you kind of explain why that's probably not going to happen. And I kind of want to get into that a little bit because a lot of musicians listen to this show. And I think it's, uh -huh. it's a cautionary tale. Yeah. Well, the, the footage is in uh, possession. I mean, the, the corporation holds that footage, yeah. and it's a good, nice 35-millimeter film. It is really good. Nice, clear shots, and the audio is clear. Uh, but I don't believe that Don and Mel want people to go to the original Grand Funk. They want them to come to this faux funk, F-A-U-X mm -hmm. funk, that they are presenting because it's a very different-looking band. And very different sounding because they don't have the original singer that sang 92% of the music. Right. You know, it's a very different thing that they are presenting. So I believe this is why it'll never see the light of day unless this, that we somehow bury the hatchet for the sake of the fans, the ones we should be concerned about. Uh, if we did it for our fans, then maybe we would see that whole thing. It'd be great. Well, you've buried the hatchet a couple, three times and kind of got the hatchet right in the back. Yeah. Um, especially <laughs> on that last one. Oh, boy. Yeah. yeah. Again, cautionary tale. Yeah, cautionary tale. I uh, came out with, because I'd been sued so many times, I'd been taken to court so many times by Don and Mel because people couldn't use the Grand Funk Railroad. They couldn't say that I was Mark Farner of Grand Funk Railroad. Even though it is historically accurate, they put it in a federal lawsuit against me that I could only advertise as Mark Farner, formerly of Grand Funk, and formerly of Grand Funk Railroad, had to be 50% of the Mark Farner font size, and only the first letter of each word could be capitalized. Oh, they get that specific? Oh, hell yes, brother. Uh, so I was constantly fighting with them, guys. My manager, Abby Steinman, says, you know, Mark, as much as I hate to, to say it, you're going to have to get away from that. If, you're, if you don't want to end up in court like you've been doing, if you don't want to be spinning your wheels all the time here, going no place, let's change. I think you should call it Mark Farner's American Band. I said, Hell yeah, that sounds good. It's got a nice ring to it. So I applied for and received the trademark on Mark Farner's American Band. Don't can touch that. Yeah, but but Don and Mel sued me. What? Yeah, they sued me. Oh. I got to circuit court in Grand Rapids, Michigan, because they said it would cause confusion in the marketplace. So they just want you out of the business. 
Oh, yeah. That's what it exactly. sounds- well, hey, when we got to federal court, we got the circuit court there. The judge pretty much said what you said and shot the thing down. That they that they would have to accept the fact that I'm going out with my legal trademarked name and it's Mark Farner's American Band. So they left with their tail between their legs. They came in thinking they were going to kick my ass, but when they walked out, they weren't happy. And all that money and the time and the just just God the hatefulness. It was just all for nothing. You know, I'm going out as Mark Farner's American band, and and they don't like that. But that's that's too bad. I I'm a bigger part of the song American Band than people really realize because I was the one that said, uh, you know, this song needs a cowbell. And Brewer said, I don't have a cowbell. I said, well, you, it needs a cowbell. You're gonna you know you're gonna have to get the cowbell. He says, I'll pick one up on the way to rehearsal tomorrow. I said, no, pick up six, dude, and we'll pick out the best one. So. He brought six bells, and we picked the best one. And, and it didn't go tink, tink, tink. It went kank, kank, right, kank, right. you know. So that and the drum lick on the intro, that I taught to Brewer because I heard it in my head. All the chord changes and the riffs are my invention. The background vocals and, you know, so much of that song I wrote. Right. But Brewer came to me after the song. We were recording in Miami at Criteria, and he came to me and says, Mark, you know, I've never had 100% right credit on any song. You think I could take it on this one? And I said, go ahead, Brewer. You know why, Don? Because I'm a nice guy. And that's not going to change me. Nothing, no experience being screwed by whoever is going to change me into being like they are. God bless you. That's the way to be. Yeah, thank you for that. I you appreciate the encouragement. You could have turned around and said, you want 100% of a song? Write 100% of a song. That's right. I want to talk about your sound. And I know there's an interesting tale behind the guitar you use. Yeah, man. Messenger. Well, our friend Bill Eberlein was a distributor and a rep for uh, Sun Amps. You remember back, oh, I don't know if you'd remember, you're only 50. No, but I know. <laughs> I've seen and used Sun Amps, so I know. Okay. Well, the Kingsmen came to Flint, Michigan, and they had Sun Amplifiers. And man, we loved the sound of them, you know? And yeah. So Dave West, amplifier maker right there in Flint, Michigan, he was uh, putting stuff together. And we ended up, myself and Dennis Bellinger, who ended up playing bass uh, in place of Mel Shocker for a couple of years in Grand Funk there in the early 80s. Yep. We worked at West Amp. We put speakers in the amplifiers. We built the cabinets. We soldered the traces on the uh, circuit boards and did everything knew those amplifiers so we told dave hey man we want to promote your amplifiers because we're from flint and you're from flint so let's do this so west amps came up with enough amps to get us going and get us on the road and uh, people found out that that sound they loved my guitar sound but i'm gonna tell you something right now my guitar was coming through a jbl d130 it's 15 inch speaker brother and most guitar players go with a 12. Yeah, that's bass player speaker size. Yeah, but man, a D130, guitar through that speaker is just phenomenal. And, and it definitely assisted with my messenger guitar that I got from Bill Eberline on payments. I paid him $25 a week. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Until I got that damn thing paid off. I, and I think he sold it to me for like $200 back then. And the the model messenger that I had, mm. an aluminum neck, and the body didn't start until the last fret. So you could play the whole scale all the way up without running into a fat piece of wood that you had to maneuver around. Right. And, th- and that was part of the charm of that guitar and what I liked about it. But if you let go of that neck... It was headed towards the ground. <laughs> it was it was neck heavy. Yeah, uh, but it had the fuzz tone built right into it. So I'd reach back with my little finger and whap. I was instant Hendrix. <laughs> Why don't more guitars do that? I mean, that's such an ingenious thing to do. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, but uh, you have the volume and you have the uh, distortion knobs side by each, right next to that switch. And oh. it was just a toggle switch, you know, on and off. Yeah. But but you could adjust that and, and get the tone that you wanted. Oh, you can dial in amp. the amount of the amount of yeah. you want. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, man. 
I'm a drummer, I, ah. uh, but I've worked with musicians. And my buddy loved the big, fat, guild guitars, but those F-holes, they squawk and feedback. Oh, yeah, they do. Yeah, and I stuffed fiberglass and foam down inside those F-holes as yep. much as I could get in there yeah. uh, before taping them up and putting my psychedelic glow-in-the-dark paint on there. <laughs> you still have that? Oh, yeah. I'm looking at it right now. I did want to bring up that you and uh, your lovely wife, Lucia. It's Lisa. Her mom spelled it different because her mom was from Cowpen, South Carolina, uh -huh. and she could spell it whatever way she wanted. Hell yeah. <laughs> I know you guys recently launched a GoFundMe campaign to raise funds for the mid-Michigan flood relief. I'm in Rhode Island. I didn't hear a thing about this. What's going on? Well, because lamestream media, they're concentrating on other efforts. Mm. Um, so you, you don't hear much about what's really going on in this country and and the flood in in the midland area mid michigan took out several lakes and homes after home after home people lost all their belongings and i'm telling you we saw local news my wife and i uh, just looked at each other and said man i wish there was something we could do Lisa said, we could, let's start a GoFundMe and raise some funds for these families because, uh, you know, nobody's going to know about it because the news is not telling us and we just need to make a statement. So we started the Mark Farner's Mid-Michigan Flood Relief for the folks in our home state of Michigan here, our, the Michiganders down there that are hurting and needed help. And, and Michigan Red Cross is on the scene and taking care of those families. So we were encouraged to do this GoFundMe and to give the funds over to the Michigan Red Cross, who is there on site. That's fantastic. And we're going to have that in the show notes. We're going to make sure everyone knows how to do that. And I know you kicked it off with a $2,000 donation yourself. And uh, it's a great cause for people who are really hurting. A lot of people are hurting out there, and yeah, brother. We, we can't fix it all, but we can all do our little slice of it. Yeah, man, and thank you for mentioning that, Dom. Absolutely, absolutely. You're a true uh, inspiration. Well, I appreciate your encouragement, and I know you're a musician, and you have uh, that love in your heart, and I honor that, brother, and I appreciate our words back and forth today, and you and I both appreciate the listener and for all you listeners, just remember who you are. You are love. You got here uh, on the teaspoon of love. And, <laughs> and you, when you leave the bone suit, uh, you'll go right back to love. And because I've already made that trip a couple of times when I had my pacemaker put in, wow. I died a couple of times. I can assure you that the blood of Jesus covers your ass and my ass and everybody's ass. That's right. Right on. Keep fighting the good fight. Appreciate it. Grand Funk Railroad with Bad Time. And I want to thank Mark Foner again for being on the It's Only Rock and Roll podcast. Be sure to come back and see us again for the next episode of the It's Only Rock and Roll podcast. Yeah.